Okay, I'm here with Paolo at the uh, Sonus Faber factory. Uh, Paolo, you're the lead designer for the Sonus Faber acoustic theme. Uh, thank you for sitting with me. Tell me a little bit about your educational background. Uh, did you study acoustics or engineering or? Well, this is, this is going to be a surprise for you because uh, my uh, background is psychology. Psychology. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, what I did at university. But of course, uh, quite obviously, I was uh, an audiophile since uh, my youngest age. And uh, of course, when you are super young and you are an audiophile, you are money less. And so you have to find a way to, to live together with this passion without money. And uh, the only solution is DIY. Okay. Right. And uh, so DIY was the beginning for me, but also I was used to work uh, in a hi-fi retailer in my own town. And I had the chance to, to meet the Sons Faber product since when I was super young. And um, I fell in love with the brand. So you've known about Sonos Faber yeah. for many years. Yeah, yeah. My first speaker, my first serious speaker was a pair of concertino first series, which I purchased back in 1995 because I was, uh, they were affordable to me at that time. And, um, and yes, this is, this started it all. Then after some years, I went working for uh, this retailer and uh, who was the guy? who sold me the concertino, but he opened his own shop in my own town, downtown, a lovely shop. And then he had a connection with the company and uh, he knew how much I loved the company and I love the Sons Faber products. So he arranged such a deal that I could go. Uh, he found a, a second hand customer for my concertino and I grabbed a pair of Minima, which was mm -hmm. a huge improvement. And I had the chance to come here purchase them and get them signed by Franco Serbi. Oh. Now the story is becoming long. To make it the shortest possible, after some years I did my own thing, I did psychology, particularly work psychology. And in order to get graduate, I had to spend 400 hours in, a, in any company, whatever. So I said to myself, well, let's try to see if the Sonus Faber, which I met a few years before, can allow me to do that. But my only expectation was, well, I have to do those boring 400 hours. Let's see if I can do them in a place I love. I sent a nice letter. I've been invited here. They remember perfectly about me. They were so nice and they told me, listen, yes, we do that, but we don't want to do that just one shot. We want to be the opportunity to see if we can, see if something more can happen. And at the time, uh, Cesare Bevilacqua, who was the CEO of the company, had this vision long before I could even realize myself that I could do this job. And uh, so I made this 400 hours, then I was hired for one year. A lot of investment has been done to allow me to study the subject. Of course, I was thirsty to learn as much as I could because I was loving, it was my toy, you know. <laughs> In the well time I got graduate, and uh, I started to work here, which I had, uh, I've been lucky enough to be teach a lot of electroacoustic. And, uh, but, and my first important commitment was to take care about incoming and outgoing controls, quality controls on transducers, which meant uh, understanding how to measure, how to double check and stuff like that. And uh, I've been lucky enough to have the chance that, that the company gave me the chance to learn something that I love, but also trusted my opinion mm. all the time. And so I feel blessed about that. So when you were doing this, you said they gave you the task to measure yeah. incoming and outgoing. I presume they actually took uh, took you through a course or, or uh, taught you what it is that you needed to learn or to know. Yeah, yeah. I, well, first of all, it was, uh, partially a uh, learning by doing process in the beginning, but also when they saw I was pretty interested and uh, things shaped a little bit better. Uh, one of the things I, I, they, they did for me was to let me attend to a course of, uh, uh, created by the guys 
which are selling us uh, the, the tools, mm. the electrical image, Audiomatica from Firenze, mm. the Clio system. Mm. I spent uh, several days, several weeks in Firenze and uh, one for four months for some time, now I can't remember, it was long ago. And uh, I learned how to use uh, the tool and what really meant in acoustic, at least as a foundation of knowledge. And uh, the rest was done by passion. So when you were doing this, uh, Franco was still here? Yeah. Okay. The first so, two years, Franco was here. Yeah. Okay. And then at what point, uh, Franco left, what year was that roughly? Franco left uh, in the summer of uh, 2006. 2006. So when he left, who now took over the design uh, responsibility? I did. Oh, you did? I did. So straight from measuring yeah, and so yeah. on, you went into design? I, I entered the company a couple of years before. Okay. March 2004. Mm. And uh, I started doing all these jobs. Basically, in the last year, half of my day was about uh, taking care of incoming controls. Half of my day was about helping out Franco. Mm. So even if, mm, you know, in a very, uh, how can I say, uh, I don't know the word in English, but, uh, you know, just helping out uh, with the maximum amount of respect, so to say, I was there when uh, Amati Anniversario and Guarneri Memento were done. Mm. And uh, then uh, it was really too early, but, uh, uh, they put me in charge of R&D. My very first design was the Ellipse, okay. which was launched at CES of 2007. Mm. So I spent the second half of 2006 uh, setting up my my first uh, design How for did the you company. Feel? Did you feel that you personally, did you feel competent and confident at that point? Or did no. You no. I was scared. It was a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, uh, it has been something like three months of uh, sleepless night. Oh my God! Oh my God! <laughs> no. But <laughs> luckily enough, uh, at that point we hired uh, a very important guy for the company, which is uh, the engineer Umberto Nicolau, who really teach me a lot and was double checking what I was doing. Mm -hmm. When I said that I was lucky to have uh, uh, I mean uh, the company believing in me is that I was making the choices but I had somebody double checking my choices mm -hmm. that was uh, that was great and I learned a lot from uh, now before that though basically Franco did everything he, he conceived yeah. the product he designed the product yeah. Yeah. everything yeah everything absolutely that's amazing yeah wow he was a genius as you started developing and putting your stamp on the product mm. and you started to learn what you wanted and liked, how do you think you started deferring, if in fact you did, from what Franco uh, tended to head towards? Oh, wow. Well, uh, I still believe that I haven't moved away. I just improved his original vision, which I agreed to in the first be? time. What would that vision be? Uh, the, the vision is that music reproduction, and this is something we even place in our brand manifesto that you can read online because we made a huge work this year thinking about who we are. Mm -hmm. And one of the core values of the brand mm -hmm. is that music reproduction has to be natural as not to be an artifact, mm -hmm. as not to sound like an artifact, has to be listening fatty, mm -hmm. free. Mm -hmm. Like any good mm, concert, particularly if acoustic, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. you, you, you never get tired of listening to live music, right? Mm -hmm. This has to happen the same, in exactly the same way when you listen to uh, a speaker system. Of course, uh, what I, my contribution to improve this thing was, uh, has been uh, and still is about uh, moving from uh, something too much on the sweet side, mm -hmm. too much slow, mm -hmm. uh, too much, uh, I'll say, dull sometimes, into something that 
still keeps a natural feeling, but of course it is enhanced with speed, transparency, articulation, and uh, a better music reproduction. But always having in mind that you, you don't have uh, to get tired or get sick about that. It, music reproduction has not to sound uh, like an artifact in any way. How do you know if you are moving closer to that goal rather than further away? Well, I trust, uh, I trust uh, my feelings, I trust my listening abilities, I trust uh, people surrounding me opinion, I trust uh, feedbacks when they come from uh, people uh, which uh, I recognize uh, they are a reference. And uh, also, you know, what I think is my only real strength is that much before being uh, an audiophile, I am a music lover. Uh, I'm more a music lover than an audiophile. So anytime I have the chance, I attend to live music. Uh, I was such in love with music that quite recently I felt the need to learn to play an instrument. It became to be a need. I'm an avid vinyl collector. Mm -hmm. I have not even more space in my house for vinyl and I had the time to listen to them all, unfortunately. But you know, this is something stronger than me. And uh, so this connection with music, this love is the one that is the thing that I trust when it comes to my design. And then of course I was lucky enough to learn a lot of things about a lot of incredible people I work with over all those years. Yeah, I have to credit uh, Umberto Nicolao, Joseph Zal, uh, mm, Lorenzo Zang, which is a retailer around here. I mean, I had, I've been lucky enough to learn from a lot of amazing people. Yeah, that's great because uh, what you said earlier uh, is that uh, in general, most people are well uh, versed with Sonus Faber, agree that where Franco's designs were unfailingly musical, they were also not the most neutral or transparent and so on. Whereas your designs continue that musicality, but have become far more neutral yeah. and far more transparent. And, and so uh, in many respects, it's in fact a better speaker that way and and, and Thank you. that was actually one of the reasons why it inspired me to want to talk to you um, so along those lines how do you design how do you decide what a new speaker should be what what starts that project how what is it inspired by well uh, of course uh, over the years some uh, there are some uh, how can I say I heard a beautiful interview about um, about Pink Floyd uh, and about David Gilmour and Nick Mason. They were talking about, you know, that they made uh, their last record a few years ago. And uh, this record was mainly made out of uh, previously recorded material, which they put together and uh, rearranged somehow. And David Gilmour uh, was used to say that this last record was kind of an homage to their whole career. Because uh, uh, at the end of the day, they realized they have a certain amount of pattern of sounds. Yes. They always played with. It's the same. After some years, you realize that when you have to do a certain speaker playing that game, in that category, you already know more or less what it has to be. And we know that mixing and matching uh, the things we have, we can get the right, uh, the right kind of uh, combination for that specific product. And then uh, the last part, you know, is uh, arranging the sound best that it can, uh, dealing with the budget, unfortunately, <laughs> because you well, always actually... have to deal with the budget. <laughs> so along those lines, Yesterday, during our meeting, you mentioned that when you first design something, you start with the design document, but you, you, you design the drivers, the enclosure, you talk to Livio, you mm. give him a design brief, and he mm. designs his, 
enclosure and so on. And then when the prototypes arrive, mm. you guys actually come to this room, yeah, right? And I'm gonna pan this, this so that everybody can see. You come into this room, and right there, right there, that famous spot there, you put that first speaker, yeah, uh, the first prototype. You assemble it all mechanically, and then you start measuring it. Uh, for things like sensitivity and impedance and so impedance on. Impedance mainly in the beginning. Right. Just to make sure that you have a general idea of what, in fact, your idea in your mind actually translates yeah. into a product. Mm -hmm. um, so now, after you've done that, after you've measured the impedance and so on, why exactly are you doing that? You, wh why why would you start with that as opposed to, as a lot of people will say, let's hear what it sounds like because, you know, you've got that product now. Well, because... Um the first thing that I do is double checking and uh, possibly improve the interaction between the transducer and its own seat, its own new house, which is the cabinet, mm -hmm. right? So before doing anything else, I have to make sure that uh, each transducer is in the perfect condition to work properly um, in the enclosure. I already know how the transducers uh, I use are sounding. Ah. I already know because I developed the transducers in first place. Being them a new development or a previously available development, uh, there's a different path, which I haven't described mm. particularly well mm. yesterday uh, about the development of transducers. So I already know how they sound. Mm. So when I go, when I approach the loudspeaker system thing, I first thing to do is to make sure that the relations, the new house of the transducer, so to say, is the right one is perfect is uh, of course uh, before anything i did some simulations but i double check the real thing i find out the right amount uh, and the right uh, kind of damping material i adjust uh, the the ducts in order to make the system resonate the way i like we have a special patent to do that which is called self reference so this is the first thing this is really the first thing right and then after that, you bring it into the anechoic chamber yeah. and you measure it. Now, at that point, you're measuring it, I guess, for uh, acoustic. Uh, acoustics. Acoustic. Um, and then while you're doing that, I guess you're also tweaking with the crossover. Yeah. Now, as, at that point, when I move from outside, where I'm doing the first thing I said, only by elastic measurement, which are not affected by the environment, of mm -hmm. course, then I move into the anechoic chamber and I start to double check the acoustic and develop the crossover network. And uh, the first stage is a purely a measurement stage. I have a, a cer certain reference for frequency response that I have in mind. And uh, I try out to see, I have, we have our paracross topology. So I build the almost perfectly measurement crossover, so to say. And then I come out and then I start to do the job like Franco was used to do. But I'm starting from a very solid foundation. Because from a technical standpoint, uh, I have double checked the enclosure, I have double checked the resonance mode inside the enclosure, I have uh, already a very nice measuring crossover network done of axis response, everything double checked in the anechoic chamber. So I start to play with it, taking measurement outside, uh, which are not particularly reliable, but can always double check with a very perfect one previously done, and listening, getting the feeling. This is in this point. So. I mean, science is unavoidable, it is super important. Science is not everything. There's a step above, which is beyond science to me. And this is um, what this brand is about. Okay, great. We're back with Paolo. Uh, Paolo, yesterday we stopped at a point where I wanted to ask you a little bit about the anechoic chamber. We uh, had a chance to take a look at it. Uh, when was that installed? Uh, it was installed and built and designed before, of course, uh, back in 2014, 2014. Okay. And as I understand it, you were saying that it's essentially certified from 100 hertz and up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is due, of course, to the dimensions. Because uh, the lower you want to go in frequency with any anechoic chamber, uh, uh, the bigger has to be, the taller has to be, particularly the absorbing materials. And of course, you need wider dimension of the room itself. We thought that uh, for our need, uh, from 100 hertz and above in fully anechoic configuration was perfect because uh, typically 
one of the trickiest thing to do without an echoic chamber is whenever you are designing a three-way or three or more way is the crossover point between uh, poofers and midrange particularly if you do this crossover network pretty low in frequency like I like to do right there you absolutely need an echoic chamber but the beautiful thing is that it's a, a, it is a, a chamber which can be configured as a semi anechoic all the absorbing elements in the floor can be moved away very easily and uh, this is super interesting because uh, you can do very precise measurements using techniques such as the ground plane right there you don't have any more than need to to have uh, the full anechoic behavior it's just uh, a very absorbing room with the and uh, with the, this technique you can clearly understand what's going on in the very low frequencies one of the things you mentioned during uh, a presentation to us uh, two nights ago or two days ago was that um, the human hearing is not linear. We are not um, s uh, equally sensitive to different frequencies. And uh, uh, you cited in particular something the, uh, the Fletcher Munson curve, for example. But you also mentioned that we are very uh, sensitive, much more sensitive at uh, middle and higher frequencies than we are, for example, in the bass. Uh, can you go into a little bit of this? Well, you know, this is very simple. This is related uh, to the struggle for survival that uh, our kind is subject to since the beginning of times, I would say. So Fletcher and Manson Kurz, like several other more advanced experiments are displaying that our hearing abilities is not linear at all. Um, and uh, just to give you some, uh, some more detail, if you want to perceive at the same level different frequencies, you have, particularly if you take as a reference 1K, mm -hmm. Uh, and say that you are using a few dBs, maybe 30, 35 dBs at 1K, to perceive 40 Hz at the same level of that 1K at 40 dB, you have to boost 20 dB or something. Mm. And this is happening also in the wide, uh, in, the higher, in the high frequency. While if you are always considering that 1K uh, at 40 dB, you might find that in the range between 2k and 6k you'd need just 30 to pursue the same level what does it mean it means that in that frequency we have super sensitive as human beings and this is due to the fact that screams of the weakest of our kind are exactly in that range of frequencies we are designed to help and to to help to help out the weakest of our kind mm -hmm. and this is where uh, uh, the the way how a human hearing apparatus works uh, comes from. There is also more. This becomes less and less uh, critical. I mean, the the, the 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 amount of boost you have to apply at certain frequencies in order to perceive them at the same level changes if uh, instead of having 1K at 40 dB, you have 1K at 80 dB. That changes a lot. You don't need that to boost that much, the the low hand and the high hand, because uh, again, this is how it works. So let's say you're doing measurements, um, hmm. um, and hypothetically, your design a speaker that measures perfectly flat all across the board at a steady state of 85, 83 decibels, hmm. and then you increase that to 90. Yeah. Um, you're basically saying that our ear will not hear a flat frequency response even though it measures it flat. Yeah, of course not. Yeah. Of course yeah. not, because uh, our hearing is not a microphone. Right. It's something different, so, something so, more complicated. So, so that leads me to the question, so how then do you as a speaker designer design something uh, that sounds neutral and flat even though it doesn't measure neutral and flat? What, what measurements do you then have to rely on besides... Quality? Well, uh, this, is, uh, this is very simple. First of all, you have to take in account that on an average base, um, 
the sound pressure level you can measure in uh, in any home listening session in the listening spot uh, is around 70 dB sometimes 80 when you're pushing very hard because uh, you know uh, each time you double the distance from the speaker you are losing 6 dB when it comes to lines uh, to point source speakers like the one we do and so even if you play very loud you won't you will never exceed so what happens at with this sound pressure lever is a reference what I do, uh, I find my own way. I slightly de-emphasize the range between 2K and 6K. It's, I always try to keep it lower than anything else. I try to stay very linear because also in other frequencies we, we learned by, I don't know how to say, it. maybe it's, uh, but we learned that things has to be quite flat, right? So say that uh, from 100 Hz up to 10K, I try to stay basically flat, not exactly, but basically flat. And then I boost a little bit uh, the bottom hand and the lower hand. Frequencies above and below uh, are boosted a little bit in my tonal balance. And uh, as a resulting effect, this kind of frequency response matches our uh, hearing sensitivities. And therefore uh, it sounds natural. It's not only like that because the choices you do uh, in terms of uh, diaphragm materials uh, plays a big role in make you perceiving a sound neutral, n natural but you know an overall tonal balance shaped this way helps mm -hmm. um, many speaker manufacturers especially in the very high end uh, choose to use exotic material well not necessarily exotic but the materials like aluminum mm. or special synthetic materials and so on you choose mm. HDF why is that? Well, uh, you know, basically saying that I choose HDF is a kind of a limitation because it really depends from the model and really depends from the kind of thing I'm trying to achieve, really depends from several things. HDF is one of the ingredients sometimes, sometimes it's the main, sometimes it's not, sometimes uh, it's just uh, one of the severals. F is, um, you know, the best compromise. It's really the best compromise most of the times because uh, it has the, the right uh, rigidity and uh, it's easy to work, which is super important when it comes to an industry <laughs> at the same time. And uh, pros and cons are very good. But of course, for us, for our history, wood is uh, always uh, the... Um, the way to go because this is where we come from and this is the way we approach from a philosophical standpoint to the loudspeaker system uh, and uh, i mean that we always think about uh, the loudspeaker system as a music instrument somehow of course uh, saying this and, pre and you can't obviously say that the loudspeaker system is a music instrument but i make you an example. Uh, yesterday I mentioned that I played the bass, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the, one of the most famous uh, electric basses is the, the jazz bass. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is very interesting to notice how much different sounds jazz bass is built in the 60s and jazz bass built in the 70s. They have a totally different sound. And this is due to a very simple, same pickup, same strings, everything. What changes is just uh, the material of the fingerboard and the material of the, the solid body. When we were in the 60s, the fingerboard was made out of rosewood into a maple neck, and you have an alder body, which has the tendency to resin in a certain way. It is, uh, the overall combination provides a warmer sound. The same exact bass in the 70s was mainly done with the maple fingerboard, so it was a one-piece maple neck, and it was an ash body. And uh, the same bass was sounding more etchy, more, uh, more on the treble, which uh, made the 70s jazz bass perfect for funk music mm. and for slap. So, believe it or not, wood has an impact. Wood is a living material. Wood uh, 
any different voice resonates in a certain way. And this is where we come from. Over the years, we also learned that if you really want to enhance the performance at the maximum level, using wo wood, which means keeping the sonus tone, combined with other materials such as aluminium, uh, you can uh, get the best of both worlds because uh, you enhance the cabinet performance without removing the wood flavor. Um, I believe you first introduced the concept or the, the technology of the anime legato yeah. in the Sonus Fiber back around 2010. Yes. What gave you the inspiration for that? Because as far as I know, I had never seen a speaker previously that used something like that. Ah, it was very simple. It was very simple. And it's very connected to the things I was explaining right now. Um, at that time, we were designing the Dyson's Fab speaker, which uh, was something uh, light years away from everything Sons Fab did before. It was a really, really, really uh, an extreme design with uh, amazingly powerful uh, transducers, amazingly powerful drivers, particularly for the bass. And we thought that such a power couldn't, or we were afraid that such a power couldn't be perfectly managed by a wooden structure only. So we ca I came with this idea to use, um, I don't know the word in English, unfortunately, but you know the kind of tool that you normally use to keep something fixed and then maybe you, you are drilling it or you are, uh, I don't know the name of that tool, but it's just clamping from top and bottom something. And this is the idea I came with at the time. Let's clamp the, the best wooden structure that we can. So to make it stronger, to make it uh, more powerful, more able to, to handle uh, high, high amount of energy. That's where the idea came from. Okay. And, and they are two connected together and they are tightened from the bottom, okay. right? And then what do you call the device that is that rod with... The, 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 the Anima engine. Legata is the name of the rod connecting the, oh, I see. the, two, the two pieces. Sometimes there's a, a rod inside, sometimes the same job is done by the, into the back of the speaker. If you look at Yamari, mm -hmm. you don't have an Anima Legata inside because mm -hmm. the job is done by, by the metal parts connecting the two parts together, like top and bottom, yeah. right? Okay. And you also you, you you also make use in, in, in other cases of mass dampers, so yeah. like round discs yeah. that are attached. And is that part of the same idea of trying to reduce uh, cabinet vibrations? No. Yes and no. Um, the point is that we use the tuner mass damper. You might have noticed, or if you don't, uh, I'd like to underline this. Tunamas damper is used only when we have a certain kind of decoupling of the speakers from the floor. Mm. We don't use mass damper when we have spikes. Mm. Because, uh, so it works perfectly in conjunction with the zero vibration system we developed. Uh, again, the Sonus Faber was the moment where we came up with these ideas and which became trademark technologies over time. We kept improving them over time. And it's about uh, realizing that if you want to announce the musical production, you want to take, you have to take care about not only the best sound reproduction, but the best silence reproduction as well. So possibly you want your loudspeaker system not creating any kind of acoustic dirtiness into your listening room. The only way to do that is avoid uh, the vibration transmission from the speakers to the floor and then to the environment, uh, having certain frequencies, particularly avoiding transmission of certain frequencies. So uh, the zero vibration transmission is, is uh, about decoupling the speaker from the floor in order to guarantee that the speaker is not uh, providing dirtiness to the to the listening environment. In theory. Uh, spikes are doing the opposite, are letting all the vibrations created inside the speakers going into the listening room. But in fact, spikes would be the perfect solution only if uh, the speaker was 
uh, laying into a huge decoupled mass from the listening room, which unfortunately is not happening. But this is why, for instance, sometimes when it comes to spike, we were used to suggest to put a huge piece of stone under the speakers with the sound decoupling material underneath. That would be the perfect solution when, when you have just a spike speaker. Uh, of course, uh, it is always good to avoid the loudspeaker system keeping the vibration produced by the mechanical work of the transducers and uh, using the spike to let those vibrations go away. But if you want to reach the highest level, you want to avoid those vibrations to travel into the listening room. So you have to decouple the speakers and avoiding with a zero vibration transmission, the transmission of certain vibration having certain frequencies. And this is done, uh, basically, this technology is about uh, uh, understanding the weight of the speakers and providing the right compliance. It's really the first time I've heard anybody articulate this uh, well and carefully because traditionally, as you know, almost everybody basically says it's spike it. Yeah, that would be good if you have a, a, a decoupled mass where the spikes are laying on. Yes. But most of the people don't. Yeah. Of course, uh, it is the perfect solution to avoid the vibration staying inside of the speaker. But when you can, you have the budget or you have the solution to do something like we do, um, you keep the listening environment acoustically clean. But unfortunately, those vibrations stay inside of the speaker, which, as I say, is very bad. Unless you have a tuned mass damper. So this is what the suspending masses are for. They basically, they are calculated in order to oscillate in antiphase with the vibration inside of the speakers. And uh, they dissipate those vibrations, transforming them into heat. So the suspended mass inside of the speakers have sense only when they are combined with uh, the zero vibration transmission technology. Understood. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, we get to the drivers now. Um, mm. There are literally hundreds of drivers available from great manufacturers and of course. early on you were using those. At some point you decided to design your own. Um, uh, um, how long have you been designing your own drivers and why take that step? Well, it sort of came out naturally over the years. There, there was not really a turning point, I would say. Um, or at least uh, my... My work in electroacoustics started like that somehow because uh, uh, the first job I did for the Ellipsa was to, at that time, was more about customizing existing drivers rather than designing our own ones. But was uh, and it was coming from a, a marketing need, which I've been told. So uh, together with um, Scanspeak, I realized the Ellipsa or the Cremona M line mid-range mid-woofer, which was a, a customized version of uh, our uh, of um, an off-the-shelf available Scanspeak transducer. And it was customized uh, cosmetically, but also it was customized uh, in order to try to improve a little bit the transparency, paying a little bit of uh, prices which were manageable with the crossover network. So. This was the starting moment when we started somehow to customize more and more, more and more uh, of the shell transducer. And after a while, we learned uh, how to do things uh, our own way. I guess that the very first Sonos Faber design loudspeaker was the. Um, the, the original Ida Midrange, that was oh. really, 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 really unique. This is, that was the first time when we designed something from scratch. So, 2011? Yeah, 2011. 2011. And uh, then, uh, a key turning point has been the Olympica line. Because right there, the same things we learned with the Aida were applied into, well, uh, the original idea was interesting also for the woofers. They were not completely customized, but they had uh, already strong ideas coming from us. But the Olympic line, this, this is exactly when we moved completely away from off-the-shelf transducers. 
And from that moment on, uh, we never moved back. For better or for worse, many, including press, believe that silk is an inferior material for Twitter in particular. Yet, Sonsfarber has mostly used silk, uh, as far as I can Yeah, remember. I would say almost only. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why the choice of silk? And in fact, ironically enough, it's in the recent past that we start seeing manufacturers going back to silk. Yeah. Why silk? Because it sounds natural. Ah. Very same, simple as that. It sounds natural. It sounds more natural than any other materials to my ears and to our ears. And, and yet you've uh, experimented and you've, you've played with beryllium? Yeah, of course. Yeah. We, were, uh, we are proud to be the very first to introduce into the market uh, a beryllium diaphragm with a diamond-like carbon deposition on top, which is a very expensive and a little bit dangerous process to do diaphragm. And um, basically that, that process, uh, without going too complicated, is able to change a little bit the structure and uh, raise a little bit the natural resonance frequency in the high frequency, of normally affecting a beryllium diaphragm. And in this way, a beryllium diaphragm which has a, for instance, properties such as an amazing microdynamic uh, stuff like that, uh, is able to sound much less like metal, which is something we always recognize in our listening session. But, uh, you know, a very good uh, silk treated the old way with the right uh, coating materials applied by the right hands is still the best solution for high frequencies and uh, our DAD technology is the the key element to enhance the performance so since you brought it up uh, can you elaborate what DAD or damped apex dome actually does yeah of course a um, little bit of background before uh, until uh, the until the end of the 90s in Sonos Faber we we were using uh, traditional dome tweeters, right? And uh, the beautiful properties of, uh, of a dome tweeter is, in my opinion, and this is not particularly related to the materials, even if uh, certain shapes uh, uh, normally done, or at, or at the time done out of silk, of coated silk or coated fabric, are able to provide an amazing performance in the off-axis response. You have a very good 30 degrees of axis, 45 degrees of axis response. You have a lot of energy right there. And this is super important in my opinion because uh, this energy is a huge contribution to one of the most beautiful magic in all musical production. And I'm talking about the speaker disappearing from the stage and letting space to music. This is what we want to achieve. Unfortunately, uh, when you start to search for precision, uh, what happens is that uh, a soft dome tweeter lacks to reach the highest possible frequencies due to the fact that coating can improve this, of course, but generally speaking, the apex of the dome have the tendency to behave in antiphase with the other surfaces of the dome. And this, unfortunately, is resulting in a cancellation of the very high frequency. That's why if you look at the dome frequency response, you quite often see a drop earlier than 20K. So, in order to improve this, Franco, in a certain moment, the beginning of uh, after the 90s, he moved into the ring tweeters. And the ring tweeters, due to their construction, they were still using the same kind of silk. Due to their construction, they were, and due to the fact that they had a tiny face plug in, exactly in the middle, they were able to perfectly extend in the high frequencies to go much up above 20K. And this was beautiful. On the other hand, unfortunately, the speakers started to sound a little bit less magic due to the fact that they are terrible performing in the um, of axis. They're really terrible of axis. They lack energy. So uh, after a while, I I wanted to bring back that magic, and uh, I get some criticism. I, I was criticized because I moved back to the do soft dome. Because if I have to trade, I prefer not to extend perfectly in the very high frequency, but to have this, you know, this huge amount of acoustic energy spread in the high frequencies by the tweeter. 
But after a while, I also realized that we could do things. And when we realized that the problem was on the dome, we started, in the beginning, we started to play with backside coating instead of the diaphragm. And to add more coating, a lot of more coating in the, in the apex of the dome internally compared to the other surface in order to make it stiffer. And that helped a lot. And then we also thought, but why don't we damp mechanically that surface? We tried it out. I guess I have the very first prototype. <laughs> this, is, this is unbelievable. This is the very first prototype of the DAD tweeter. And uh, we see a huge improvement and uh, we say, okay, let's do it. So that was a stroke of genius. Yeah. The innovation that came out of nowhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. And you've trademarked it, I hope. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, so you have the best of both worlds, basically, yes. very clearly. Yeah. I re realized that more and more, uh, Sonus Farber now talks about uh, the crossover, whereas before he really didn't say very much. Again, we're talking quite a few years ago. Uh, well, it's not true. In the beginning, uh, in the beginning, there was uh, a huge, huge, huge communication, uh, at least in Italy. I don't know if this communication was spread over the world, but in the beginning, Franco was very proud of his very, very, very simple crossover mm. network. And uh, he was going most of the time, anytime he could, with first order designs. How has that changed? Well, first of all, mm, you have to be very lucky with uh, phase combination between transducers, and this is kind of unpredictable, at least in my experience. Sometimes it works perfectly, sometimes it doesn't. So it's very hard uh, to get uh, a good result. But also, even if I recognize the, such an, uh, an approach as a, a distinctive sound, which is very sweet and warm, is very immediate because uh, you don't have, uh, you have a minimal amount of reactive components into the signal part. But the price you have to pay is high distortion, is uh, lack of speed, is uh, phase problems, uh, particularly when you move uh, off axis. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we found a way to make our speaker sounds natural without compromising with that. I mean, uh, if the cursor network is designed properly, you don't have to, to worry about that. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the, when I say design properly, I mean to use the minimum amount of component necessary. So is it typically um, a third order? Well, it depends. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. Okay. It's not. Well, basically, uh, it is still a first order. Um, anytime I'm dealing with uh, the mid uh, the mid frequency transducer, so my mid range is always a pure first order bandpass, or when it comes to to weight design, is that first order slope uh, mid woofer. So you have just one relative component in series to the signal, and uh, because uh, you know I'm thinking about to the speaker almost like. Uh, uh, a monoway design. So I, we, I really focus uh, and put a lot of care in designing a very strong, sweet sounding mid band uh, transducer. And I make this transducer mo do most of the job. Woofers and Twitter are just completing. I also want to, just want to use it doing most of the job because this is also, is helping the natural feeling. If you pay attention, and if the crossover network is done um, properly, you can detect by hearing that something's going on in the crossover frequency or in the crossover region. I want to avoid that. I want to keep one transducer doing most of the job, particularly when it comes to human voices. And to do that, uh, and I go always with very gentle slopes. But I do a lot of compensations in parallel which uh, helps uh, avoiding uh, distortion problems, uh, or which uh, helps a lot uh, controlling. And then I add third, fourth order sometimes uh, things uh, in top and bottom, so that I have the speed, I have the articulation, I have the control, I have uh, 
the lowest possible amount of distortions and uh, this is my way of doing things so it's in, it's not just one order just any way has his own so to say uh, let's move to the 35th anniversary uh, Sonus Faber celebrates its 35th anniversary this year mm -hmm. uh, earlier in our conversation you spoke very respectfully and with great love and admiration for the founder Franco Serblin which models did you introduce to celebrate the company's 35th anniversary? Well, uh, you know, we we just picked uh, one of the most iconic of the ultra classic design from the past, which was the Electa Amateur. The Electa Amateur is the most iconic because uh, few people know this, but it was the very first international success of the company. The company was founded back in 1983 and the speakers came out back in 1987, four or five years after. And uh, it has been the very first speakers uh, widely exported by the company, particularly in Japan. They had an amazing success in Japan. The speakers before were, uh, the, the market was mainly, if not only, Italy. With that speaker, International market uh, became a, a matter of fact for the company. So it has been very popular. And uh, it's not the extreme which was strange on by his own. Uh, it's just the, the most iconic traditional songs for speaker. And we just made, uh, we thought it was nice to celebrate this birthday, making a reinterpretation of that speaker. So it is, uh, the techniques and the materials uh, used at that time, but uh, there's a today knowledge. So I guess it is an interesting combination. More, uh, they are slightly different also from the tonal, from tonal balance perspective. They are not the, the, the today tonal, Sonus Faber tonal balance. They try to go a little bit back also with the tonal balance. They are not, uh, they are not as linear, my speakers are, on, are never linear, but they are not as linear as my recent design are. They are a little bit more uh, 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 smiling mouth kind of frequency response, which was the things that Franco was doing in the, back in the days. Okay. The other thing I found uh, by accident is that you're reintroducing the Sonus Faber. Yeah. Um, tell me more about it. This was the mythical speaker that you could read about, that the few lucky uh, reviewers who saw, heard it, spoke with almost hushed tones that they had been to Mount Olympus, but almost nobody else had ever seen or heard it. What was the decision that brought it back and what have you done to uh, uh, um, quote unquote renew it, update it, etc. Wow, uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, it just happened, uh, I would say, without a proper intention. It just happened that uh, we started to receive a lot of requests. A lot of requests to have some this one's Faber done back again by a particular distributor which I won't mention. And uh, you know, after a while, after a while, after a while, okay, let's do a couple of pairs. And uh, even if most of the materials used right there were uh, the pinnacle, still are the pinnacle, you know, the experience that uh, we grow with over the years. Uh, was much improved and also we had some um, crazy materials and also this Onus Faber speaker uh, for us always been like uh, how can I say kind of a training ground this is the place where we experiment this is the place where we really think out of the box and uh, where we do experience with which then uh, are uh, 
turning into trademark solutions, for instance. It, all, it, it happens quite a lot. So we say, well, let's do it. Let's do it special. So I completely redesigned the crossover network. Uh, I felt that particularly the way I managed the woofer was improvable. It was definitely improvable. Also, we had a better mid-range, a much better mid-range. I have to say that, sorry, the Sons Fire mid-range was the very first design, Sons Fire Bertans Lusa. No, the other one was the second, sorry, it was the Sons Fire. But in fact, we had a much we had the seventh generation now, so we place a better mid-range. And then we thought, well, we, we did this, it's a crazy speaker. We did this crazy Twitter design, let's use the crazy Twitter design on this crazy speaker. And uh, what happened is that um, basically uh, they like it a lot and uh, they turn into um, an available product under request, by request. It has been super interesting. It has been super interesting and uh, you know, when you are playing with uh, 115 inch and couple of a 10 inch all in the same speaker wow it's fun that's one way to put it um rob report uh, in 2011 named it the finest speaker of the year possibly ever and that's uh, quite an amazing thing given that uh, they are basically reporting on the very finest of anything and everything so, mm. Um, quick last few questions. Um, name some companies whose speakers you admire that you think, wow, that's a really good design. Well, uh, I I have several, but uh, you know, not they're not coming from uh, our age most of the time, or sometimes yes. But uh, I've always been uh, a huge fan of uh, Pro AC, yeah. England. Mm -hmm. uh, their design from the 80s and the 90s were amazing. I mean, Stuart Tyler is uh, yeah. it's great. He's a great electroacoustic designer. Of course, uh, Lawrence Dickey mm -hmm. and the Nautilus. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still remember the first time I heard uh, the original Nautilus. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a shocking experience. This has been among the few ex listening experiences that really made me fall in love with this game. And it was uh, 21 years ago, 22 years ago. It was my very audio, first audio show. I was in my early 20s. And uh, wow, it was a massive system with um, Jeff Roland amplification, uh, Jadi, preamp, and this pair of an out. It was wow. It was amazing. It was a VPI top of the line to the table. And another crazy experience has been exactly with the other brand I just mentioned, Pro AC, um, which uh, was about uh, Nelson Pass amplifier, clear audio top of the line to the table. Those two systems kind of shocked me. But there are some others. Uh, I, if we move talking about different technologies, the big system from MBL is among my favorite. Really, wow. Unbelievable. Uh, what else? Magnepa. Magnepa has always been a uh, speaker's... Uh, Livio has a pair. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Do you ever feel like throwing it up no. when he's not there? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. The other models, I don't know for some reason, no. But uh, what about P7, what about mm. P6, that generation was beautiful to me. Mm. I have beautiful memories. Uh, yeah, those are the the ones that comes to my mind. I like uh, I like ATC speakers quite a lot. I like ATC speakers from UK. Of course, uh, the three slash five is an obvious thing to mention. Um, ah, yeah, the the Yamaha Mille, the Yamaha one thousand. Of course, <laughs> this is another speaker, totally different, which I love. Those are more or less the speakers okay. I really admire. Okay, uh, Ferrari or Tesla? Ferrari. <laughs> Tubes or transistors? The 
pants. <laughs> Cop out. Jeff Buckley or Katie Lang's version of Hallelujah? Jeff Buckley. Good choice. Lennon or McCartney? George Harrison. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome.